Joining us now is Peter Ajak. He is one of the so-called lost boys of Sudan, the estimated 20,000 young boys separated from their families in the late 80s during the country's civil war. He's now the founder and director of the Center for Strategic Analyses and Research, an independent policy think tank based in Juba, South Sudan. He joins us from Nairobi. Peter, thanks for joining us. There is now a new agreement in place to cease hostilities. What do you make of that new agreement? Do you think it's going to hold? Well, you know, this is the eighth time that they have made this agreement. Uh, the first one was in January, and every few months they kept on signing a uh, ceasefire agreement. The last one was at the 1st of February, 1st of this month. But even as we speak right now, uh, the two forces are on offensive. The uh, opposition forces are offens of, on offensive from Bentiu, attacking the oil fields. And then the South Sudanese army is on offensive in Jongle State, uh, advancing into the Nuer territory. So clearly the ceasefire is not holding as we speak. Are there any monitoring forces in place to make sure that when they do have an agreement of this kind that it will be observed? Is there any way of enforcing this? They have uh, made that agreement that a, re a, a, a coalition of regional force would be deployed. Uh, this will include the Ethiopians, uh, some of the Ugandans that are already on the ground, possibly some troops coming from Kenya. This has all been agreed, but it, none of it has been implemented because it is supposed to be pending uh, the signing of the final agreements. One of the things that came out uh, uh, earlier this month with the new agreement they signed was a commitment made by the two parties to return to Addis on the 20th of this month and start negotiation toward uh, signing a comprehensive agreement. And this would include uh, possibility for signing uh, a, a permanent ceasefire. So I suppose uh, that the only opportunity where this uh, monitoring force will come into effect would be after the permanent peace agreement, uh, uh, permanent ceasefire has been signed. And this will allow, make it possible now for the regional forces, the Ethiopians and the Kenyans and the rest to come in and be able to uh, uh, monitor uh, the, the ceasefire. There is another meeting scheduled for February 20th. That's this coming Friday. Uh, if there is an agreement on a ceasefire, what is the essence of the political agreement here? Is it that both sides share power, that they be a power-sharing government? That is the only thing that is remaining now, is really the sharing of power, the structure of power. There are other issues that the opposition is trying to squeeze in, uh, especially the structure of the entire government and the governance system in the country. Uh, the rebel forces have been fighting seriously for federalism, uh, they argue that the current centralized structures have not worked and that they want some sort of federalism to be put in place. But it's also important to remember and to recall that the sources of uh, disagreement really emerge from the political party, uh, the SPLM. Uh, this is where the initial differences start and then they expand it into the army and to the government. Uh, so there have also been uh, parallel processes that have been going on in Tanzania in Arusha. I actually just returned uh, only a few hours ago from Arusha. I was attending some of these talks. And uh, late last month, uh, President Kir and Riyak Mashar, they signed an agreement to reunite all the factions of the SPLM. There are now three factions, the opposition faction, the one in Juba, and there is also the former political detainees, a group of uh, uh, 11 senior SPLM officials that were detained in, in, in Juba. So this is now a separate group. So uh, last month they signed an agreement uh, to address really the core issues that started the fighting within the SPLM. And initially there were only three main problems. Uh, the main problem really was the issue of uh, election within the SPLM. What would be the mechanism? Uh, those around the president wanted uh, a show of hand to be used as the mechanism for electing uh, the, the chairperson. Uh, the rest of the groups wanted a secret ballot. The other issue was really uh, the leadership of the SPLM, the deputies, the members of the highest political organ uh, known as political bureau, the mechanism for electing them. Uh, Salva Kiir wanted to be able to appoint uh, this group. The other group, they wanted to be able uh, to, to have these people be elected. The final issue was the issue of delegates, the delegate to the national convention. Uh, the president wanted to some powers to be able to appoint a certain proportion of the total de delegates. So these were the initial issues. And in the agreement they signed in Arusha, they agreed to basically move on to secret ballot,
to move into elections of, of, of the leadership, and at the same time to, uh, to, to, to make sure that no delegates are nominated by the chairperson. So it's quite unfortunate that uh, at the end, uh, these issues that caused uh, the violence are now being addressed. Uh, but that is one element. The one that is remaining in Addis now is really the distribution of powers, especially within the executive, and also the parliament. The opposition is pushing for parliament uh, to, be, uh, to, to, be, to, to, to be abolished uh, and, and, and to be reconstituted again with the different and new members uh, put in into, into the parliament. So these are the remaining issue, but the main issue really is the structure. Uh, what, what do you do with Machar? Do you make him a, a vice president again? or do you make him a prime minister? And what sort of powers do you give to him? Uh, and then there will be other more technical issues, uh, issues such as what to do with the fighters, because now there are civilians that are backing Machar, and then there are also the former group. So these are the challenges now that will have to be addressed. Right, and one of the proposals that was made by the African Union as well as neighboring countries to enforce these agreements was for there to be targeted sanctions, as they called it, on individuals if necessary to make sure that this agreement uh, is adhered to. Nothing has been done so far. I mean, do you have faith in the African Union that it could enforce something like this? It's very unclear at this time. There are major uh, regional financial interests in South Sudan. Uh, just to take an example of Kenya. There is a very serious banking uh, industry in South Sudan that is largely owned by Kenyan. So that interests are very deep. The same thing with Uganda is the main supplier of food to South Sudan. Kenya at the same time is the main supplier of fuel to South Sudan. The Sudan, on the other hand, is receiving uh, uh, money from the use of its pipeline. Uh, the only countries where uh, interest is not as deep is Ethiopia. Uh, but the problem so far has been uh, putting forward a credible peace uh, process. One of the main things that has been disappointing in this process throughout has been a lack of uh, competence, or rather gross incompetence, uh, from the mediators. Uh, they have not been able to really use uh, the advantage and at the same time challenge the kind of like spirit that came out of Arusha and use it uh, to reach an agreement. Uh, this has been a main challenge because uh, in the last round, both the opposition and the government went to Addis Ababa looking for an agreement. But the problem was the mediators went and changed the structure I don't know if you recall, but before uh, uh, this round, previously the government and the opposition forces had agreed that they would have a president and a new post of prime minister would be created for Machar. This was what was agreed. But when they went back to Addis for this latest round, they were surprised by a new proposal that did not even include the prime minister. There was now a proposal to make Machar a first vice president, and the current vice president, Juan Iga, was to be demoted to a second uh, vice president position. So one of the things that has made it difficult really to, to put forward this uh, sanction has been the failure of mediators to put forward a, a sustained uh, peace uh, process. They keep on changing their minds and also they, they have not been able to control the regional interest from interfering very much with the agreement itself. But at the same time, I think uh, there is a need to continue to put pressure on the two parties so that they achieve agreement. Now they have put themselves in, on paper, agreeing that they must achieve peace agreement by 5th of March. And by the end of March, they will agree with all the pre-transition arrangement. And the transitional government is supposed to start on the 9th of July 2015 and run for 30 months. This is, has all been agreed. The thing now is really to put them to task so that they, 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 they remain committed to what they have agreed. This will now require, first of all, uh, the mediators to really improve on their work and to be more uh, engaged and to prevent other regional interests from interfering with the agreement. If the parties then are unwilling for some reason or uh, including some unreasonable demands in the process, this is where the targeted sanctions would be very necessary and they should be enforced. And even after the peace agreement is agreed, there is a need to look also at the, some of the assets that these leaders have. As you recall, uh, South Sudan has recently been rated by the Transparency International as the fifth most corrupt country in the world. Uh, and th this has largely came from how the oil sector and the oil industry is managed. If you recall also about three years ago, the president wrote a letter uh, to 75 uh, former and uh, ministers 
and argue and ask them to return an estimated $4 billion that they had allegedly stolen. So some of this asset was acquired through illegal means. And even if the leaders agree to a peace agreement, there is a need also to look at, at these assets and possibly even confiscate them, do some investigation, and uh, see if this money can be uh, taken back to South Sudan and, and be used for the reconstruction purposes. Peter Ajak, thank you for joining us, sir. United Nations says more than 6 million people, that's more than half of South Sudan's population, need humanitarian assistance. We'll discuss the humanitarian aspect of the conflict with a panel of experts. That's coming up right after the break. You're watching The Heat.